This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome. I am absolutely delighted to welcome all of you to the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine today. This is a much anticipated occasion. We have the launch of the CANBAR lecture on innovations in integrative medicine today. This is our inaugural lecture and we have a fantastic inaugural guest speaker. And I have the pleasure now of introducing two people. First of all, the um, uh, gentleman who has made this series possible. And I want to begin by acknowledging Mr. Canbar, who I'm delighted is here with us today, and acknowledge and thank him for his vision and the tremendous generosity that he has shared uh, through supporting the Osher Center's Living Endowment Fund, which is making possible this series as well as uh, a whole um, a host of opportunities that we can share both with UCSF and through modern technology with the rest of the world. So thank you so much, Mr. Canbar. Now, I can't let you get off that easy because you're just too fascinating a person and I wanna share a few things so that people understand what uh, a, a remarkable human being you are. Mr. Canbar uh, is a graduate in 1952 of Philadelphia University. It was then known as the Philadelphia Textile Institute and he studied materials science. Now, when I say that he's a remarkable human being, I, um, I am not being um, inappropriately effusive. He is an inventor, he's an entrepreneur, he's an author, he's a film producer. He's well known for many inventions and they are as wide ranging as his interests. He has more than 50 patents for uh, a whole variety of things that he has invented. And I wanna give you just a few examples so you understand what I mean by this broad scope. Um, one of my favorites, he invented the defuzzit uh, comb for sweaters. <laughs> he invented uh, Tango's puzzle game. Um, now listen to the rest of this, the safety glide hypodermic needle protector, a cryogenic cataract remover, a new LED traffic light. He created New York's first multiplex cinema, the quad cinema. And another personal favorite of mine, uh, zip notes, which are rolled sticky notes that have a center line adhesive strip and are a huge advance on, on post-its. And I have uh, one of these in my office, so thank you for that. I'm happy to write you all short notes and uh, share that with you. Um, then continuing in terms of this breadth, he also produced an animated film, Hoodwinked in uh, 2006 is when it came out. And there's also an interesting range of consumables that you'll appreciate now over lunch. On the one hand, um, he brought to market uh, something called Sioux food or superfood, which is a meal of grains and rice and lentils. And what some might consider on the other end of the spectrum, he uh, developed a hangover proof vodka, sky <laughs> vodka and blue angel vodka. Something tells me you're most known for that. Uh, Mr. Canbar also is the author of Secrets from an Inventor's Notebook, came out in 2002, I, I commend that to you. And, uh, and this is just a, um, characteristically royalties from the sales of the book go to the New York University School of Film where there is the Canbar Institute for, uh, of Film and TV. Now, Mr. Canbar's um, generosity and philanthropy are legendary in UCSF and again, just to name a couple of different things, um, very familiar to those of us at UCSF. He established the UCSF CANBAR Center for Advanced Simulation and Education, and that was in 2006. And that is a program, um, uh, e equipment and a space that is used by all health professional students 
at the university, and there isn't an educator among the thousands of us uh, at UCSF who are not uh, grateful for that uh, innovation. Mr. Canbar also created the uh, Canbar Cardiac Center at the California Pacific Medical Center and the Kaiser Performing Arts Center, which is the home of the San Francisco Girls Chorus. The list goes on and on, and I do want to get to my second introduction, so I'll just say that Mr. Canbar is truly the, the quintessential innovator. He's endlessly curious. He's constantly seeking ways to improve the way we do things. Some of us notice things that need fixing and then leave it at that, and Mr. Canbar looks closely and discovers what can be done to improve. So everybody, please uh, join me in welcoming and thanking Mr. Canbar for his support. And now I have the opportunity to introduce another sort of innovator, Dr. Hélène Langevin. I'll do a quick, quick bio because the only thing more interesting than hearing about your accomplishments is hearing from you. So we'll move to that quickly. Uh, Dr. Langevin earned her degree uh, in medicine from McGill, and she completed a postdoctoral research fellowship in neurochemistry in Cambridge, England at the Medical Research Council Neurochemical Pharmacology Unit. And she completed her residency in internal medicine and uh, a fellowship in endocrinology and metabolism at Johns Hopkins. In her free time, uh, Dr. Langevin uh, was appointed director of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital in uh, 2012. This is one of our, our sister Osher Center sites uh, out, of the, out of the five in existence. And she's the Bernard Osher Professor in Residence of Complementary and Integrative Medical Therapies. She's also visiting professor of neurology, orthopedics, and rehabilitation at the University of Vermont College of Medicine. Um, she, you, are probably best known for discovering cellular and molecular mechanisms involved in the field of acupuncture. And I love the uh, quote from the Boston Globe um, describing you as a celebrity in the world of acupuncture, a field um, not known necessarily for a variety of celebrities, but you absolutely encompass that. Um, uh, Dr. Langevin has been the principal investigator of several NIH-funded studies investigating the role of connective tissue in chronic pain and the mechanisms of acupuncture and manual and movement-based therapies. So that's sort of the CV. I want to say in a personal note, and um, everyone that works with uh, Ellen knows that um, your innovation, your um, uh, creative intellect, your ceaseless curiosity make you uh, an ideal collaborator, an ideal teammate, and a wonderful person to learn from. So thank you so much, Helen. Thank you so much, Shelley. Um, is this on? Yeah, it's on now. Uh, thank you so much for this kind introduction. And uh, I want to extend uh, my thanks to Mr. Kanbar for um, making it possible for me to, to be here today, which really means a lot to me. And uh, I also want to really uh, um, say how grateful we are to the Osher Foundation for making the work that I'm going to present uh, today possible. Um, and. Uh, this is, this is really uh, quite remarkable because, uh, as Shelley mentioned, these, these work, the, the, the work that I'm going to talk about is, is, um, is kind of unusual in the sense that it, it's not a lot of, of uh, uh, it, takes, it, it takes a special kind of environment to be able to support uh, research that's a little bit uh, kind of out of the ordinary. Uh, and, and we are very fortunate to have uh, this kind of support in order to be able to do that. So it's, it's very, very important to us. And we're very thankful. So I'm going to be talking about stretching, connective <coughs> tissue, chronic pain, and cancer. Quite a disparate set of words. But um, I'm going to start with a riddle. And I'm going to ask, what do yoga, acupuncture, and manual therapy have in common? And if you go back to the title of the lecture, I think you'll probably have an idea that it has something to do with stretching. And uh, indeed, uh, when we, when we uh, stretch our bodies, uh, when we do uh, exercise, like yoga, for example, or when we have a, a massage, 
you know, it's, it's easy to imagine that there's some kind of stretching of tissues that takes place both via the hands of the uh, practitioner and, and the, the actual movements of the person themselves. But it's a little bit less obvious about, about acupuncture. So uh, this is something that got me really interested a long time ago, very, uh, that kind of prompted the whole uh, research uh, projects on acupuncture, is the idea that acupuncture needles stretch tissues. And the way they do that is by kind of manipulating the tissues, almost, almost stretching from the inside. Once the acupuncture needle is inserted, it kind of, the tissues grab around the needle. And then when you rotate the needle, it's kind of, I, I, I like to think about it as like forget spaghetti winding around a fork. And then once that has happened, every direction that you move your needle, the tissue moves with it. So it's a way to, to sort of grab onto the tissue and stretch it. It's a very in interesting uh, thing. And so, all of those, uh, both yoga, acupuncture, and uh, manual therapies or massage result in some kind of stretching and of connective tissue. And this little, a lovely little cat up here is there to remind us that stretching is something that it's not just us. Animals do it, and they do it spontaneously, and babies also, and, and, and people too, human. We stretch. Why? Because it feels good. But the purpose of, of the whole talk, you'll see, is to, is to explore the idea that stretching, not only does it feel good, but it's actually good for us. And what happens when we stretch? And, and, and all of the, the, the work that we've done to try to uncover that. So the, a, a big focus of, of my lab is on connective tissue. And the reason for that was because of that original observation with the acupuncture needles. It got us really intrigued as to what happens when you stretch connective tissue. And connective tissue is, I, I think it's like, uh, I consider it to be like the, uh, an unsung hero of the body. Um, we don't pay enough attention to it. We really should. Um, and be, and the, one of the reasons is that uh, connective tissue is, is one of these things that's name tells us. It's a connector. It connects things. Uh, you can draw a map. It, it forms a network through your whole body. You can draw a line going through any point of your body to any other point of your body via a path of connective tissue, right? It surrounds everything around every muscle, every bone, every nerve, and it goes inside organs, inside your liver, your heart. There's like a web of connective tissue. It connects everything. It's, am it's amazing. And so it's part of the musculoskeletal system because it, and it goes around the muscles. It's part of the muscles because it, it goes inside the muscles as well. It forms the structure of the muscle. But you wouldn't know that by looking at textbooks of orthopedics, for example, or rheumatology, which are the two disciplines of medicine that are supposed to be interested in the musculoskeletal system. You're lucky if you find a paragraph on connective tissue. It's, it's really very strange to me. The other thing that's interesting about connective tissue is it's also part of the immune system. And that is, again, something we have to stop and think about why. And the reason is that the immune system, if when we think of the immune system, we think of like white blood cells, right, that patrol the body, that go around the body and, and check out to look for bad things, bacteria or antigens, things that, are, that we want to get rid of, or even, even cancer cells. They look around for trouble. And then what they do is they come back to the lymphatics and to the lymph nodes and the spleen, and then they report the information that they found. And, but all of this, patrolling around, getting the information, going back to this all happens in connective tissue. Connective tissue is actually the terrain. It's the area. It's the housing of, of, the, of much of the immune system. And we don't often think about that. So, um, I'm going to be talking a lot about the intersection between musculoskeletal function and immune function. How does, how does the movement, the stretching, the, all the stuff that we do, how does that influence the immune system? So one of the things that we also are very interested in the connective tissue is because it's involved in, uh, in, in the musculoskeletal system and also in musculoskeletal pain. Uh, musculoskeletal pain is something that we know very, very little about. And uh, a lot of times, for example, people will have low back pain, terrible back pain, and disabled, can't work. Uh, and they go to the, have a, 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 an x-ray, MRI, everything is fine, their spine is normal, there are no protruding discs, the person still has back pain. Why is that? 
And in the last, I would say, 10, 20 years, people have gotten very interested in the role of tissues outside of the spine and uh, uh, tissues of the back. And the connective tissues here, particularly this huge structure here in the back called the thoracolumbar fascia. And fascia is another word for connective tissue. And this structure in the back, we know now, contains sensory nerve endings. And, and we are tr starting to understand that a lot of back pain has to do with this thoracolumbar fascia and its relationship to the muscles of, of the back. So in my lab, we got really interested in the thoracolumbar fascia. Some years ago, we did an ultrasound study. And we looked at what the thoracolumbar fascia looks like in ultrasound. So this is just to orient you. This is a picture, an ultrasound picture of someone's back. Here's the skin. Here's the black stuff here is the subcutaneous <laughs> fat. And underneath this big, thick white band here, that's that thoracolumbar fascia. And we're seeing it in cross-section. This is what it looks like in a normal person. But then we started noticing that some people where it looks, the fascia looks thicker, and then it might even look like that, sort of disorganized and sort of not good looking, right? And we wondered, could this have something to do with, how, with the reason why some people may have back pain? Is there something wrong with the fascia? So we did a study of 107 subjects, and we measured how thick this fascia was. So we measured the, the subcutaneous tissue, and we also measured the, the, this fascia here, which is this area that I highlighted in green. <coughs> When we measured the whole thickness between the skin and the muscle, you can see that it was thicker here, and also what we call the echogenicity. Uh, in that's the, this is an ultrasound term that, in, that denotes how many echoes are generated by the ultrasound. And so the people with back pain here in black had a thicker and more echogenic thoracolumbar fascia. This is the whole thickness. When we looked at the subcutaneous thickness here, it's the same. But when we looked at the perimuscular, which is the fascia right around the muscle, that's where that difference came from. So people with back pain had a thicker fascia than people without back pain. We didn't know why. But we were curious as to whether this thicker fascia may have something to do with perhaps an old injury that hadn't healed, or some inflammation, or something that was causing the fascia to get stuck and not move properly. So we did another study where we looked at the different layers. The important thing to realize is this fascia is composed of many different layers. And they're all supposed to move. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you how that, how that happens. So if, um, Angela, if you could click the first movie. This is a movie of somebody who's lying uh, down on a table, face down. And the table feet is moving up and down. And you can see here that this, this, their back is essentially the person is moving like this, passively, up and down. And their fascia is getting stretched. And you can see that the layers within the fascia are gliding. They're not moving all at the same rate. Can you, can you see that these layers are not moving at the same? There's kind of movement between those layers, a little bit like stuff slipping and sliding. right? That's normal. Now, if you could please click the video of the person with back pain. This person doesn't quite look so sliding. You see how it kind of looks like it's pulling and tugging, and it's not really, it doesn't look quite as, as happy and as, as, as kind of fluid, right? And so um, we hypothesized that this is something that may be associated with back pain. So we measured this movement using a technique called elastography, where you can actually take those images and measure the relative motion between the tissue layers. And we found that, lo and behold, it was reduced in the people with back pain compared with controls. We also found interesting difference between men and women. So the females in general had higher movement than the males. But in both males and females, it was reduced in people with back pain. So it's not something that's restricted to either men or women. Everybody gets it. Uh, if you have back pain, it tends to get reduced. So why would that be? Well, we know that if you have an injury anywhere, um, what happens is that the body tends to heal the injury. And so this is an example of cross-section through the skin. And uh, this is the subcutaneous muscle. And this is the fascia here. And this is the, the underneath the muscle. And this is a tiny little injury that affected these two layers. And you can see that once the injury has healed, the two layers have stuck together. They've become fused. And this is what we call an adhesion. And adhesions mean that layers are adherent. They're not, they're not independent. They can't move. And we think that maybe that's what's happening in the people with back pain. 
is that somehow maybe they, they were shoveling snow perhaps someday, and they kind of, you know how you, you say, oh, I wrenched my back, you know. And, but we don't know. There, nothing shows up on x-rays. Their back hurts like hell, but they, they kind of you know, hobble along for a couple of days, and then they get better. Well, we think that what happens during these little sort of micro injuries that make cause some little sort of a little bit of tearing. And these are not big tears, but over time, they may kind of result in some loss of function. The ability of the body to heal wounds is vital, right? If, if we didn't have that, we would die. Like, for example, if you were a, a lion in the jungle, for example, and you have a big cut on the side of your, of your, your back, there's, no, there's nobody there to stitch you up, right? So in the old prehistoric times when we did not have you know, surgery and you know, the ability to stitch wounds, if a wound was gaping open and was not able to heal itself and close, then, that, then the person or the animal w w would literally uh, not survive. So this is a very, very, very important mechanism that is, is, is essential for survival. And we don't often think about it where you cut yourself. And after a couple of days, at first you know, have some pain and you have a little scab. And then somehow your tissues are able to regenerate that gap across the, uh, the, the cut. And they produce what we call fibrous uh, tissues that form essentially a scar, right? And uh, this is a very complicated and, and, and uh, well-orchestrated reaction that allows the tissues to uh, essentially mend themselves. And inflammation, right, is uh, the first step of this. You cannot heal the wound until, but if you do not have a proper inflammatory response. So the first step is, uh, these inflammatory cells are going to get called over, and they're going to come to the area, and they're going to start to secrete all kinds of molecules and chemicals to sort of mount this whole kind of uh, response, and then eventually heal. So what happens then next? Well, eventually, this inflammation has to go away. It has to, what we call, resolve itself. Um, and so eventually, if everything goes well, all of this stuff gets cleaned out, and what you, you're left with is a tiny little, essentially, scar. But the tissues are eventually normal, right? They go back to normal, except for the fact that they had this little scar, and perhaps they've lost a little bit of that of mobility. You've all had you know, little scars here and there, but it doesn't interfere with, with, your, with, with anything. However, there are times when this resolution mechanism fails. And this whole inflammatory response that was essential to uh, heal the wound persists and continues for, for days and weeks on end. And what you get now is what's called chronic inflammation. And that's not good. Because chronic inflammation has really no business being there. It shouldn't be there anymore. The, the, the job is done. And they sh it should clear away. But somehow, it stays. And the consequence of chronic inflammation is something that we call fibrosis, which is essentially a spreading of essentially scarring out of control. And people can get fibrosis in various parts of their bodies, in their kidneys, their lungs, uh, their, their, and, 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 and these, are, these are serious pathologies when they happen. And there's a lot of effort trying to uh, understand the mechanism underlying fibrosis. Now, in the musculoskeletal system, we don't know a whole lot about this yet. But we know that when you get chronic inflammation and fibrosis somewhere, which we think is happening in the case of our thickened thoracolumbar fascia, remember, um, this causes increased stiffness. The tissues are not as, not only do they not glide as well, but they're also stiffer. And so that restricts movement. And that's not good. Why? Because if you have pain, you're also not going to want to move because it hurts to move. And therefore, you will have what we call fear of movement. And there's, there's a, it's, this is a very understood now as being an important component of back pain. Because people just don't want to bend their, back, bend their back because it hurts. And therefore, they will avoid moving the area that hurts, which contributes further to restricting the mobility. And so you have restricted mobility coming from two different directions, from the increased stiffness, from the the injury, the, the inflammation, the fibrosis, and also from the behavior of the person, contributing to somebody ending up with uh, connective tissue that's not happy at all. Because connective tissue needs to move in order to be healthy. So we're going to talk some more about that. 
So I also want to talk about another area where connective tissue is extremely important, and that's cancer. And um, it used to be, years ago, we used to think that ca cancer is about tumor cells, right, growing out of control, somehow uh, invading the body. We now know that it's not just that. Cancer needs something to grow onto. It needs a, a bed. And that bed that it grows onto is, guess what, connective tissue. The, it has a name. We call it stroma. And it's the tumor stroma. You can see this is an example of a tumor that has, the, so the tumor cells are what you see here in these little pockets. But the stroma are this kind of these sort of strands of connective tissue that can essentially hold the tumor together and they feed, they help the tumor grow. So the tumor is essentially hijacking the connective tissue of the person to help it to grow into a bigger tumor. And there's, there are cases where this becomes very extreme. You can see here, this is an example of a tumor where this pink stuff is the connective tissue. This is essentially fibrosis. And uh, we call it even, a, it's called, there's a name for it, it's called a desmoplastic reaction. And these tumors that have very strong amount of fibrosis tend to have a bad prognosis. They don't do as well. And there's some very, very elegant research happening at the University of Wisconsin right now in the lab of, of uh, Dr. Patricia Keeley where they have shown that there's these, uh, if you look very carefully at this stroma, this is the connective tissue inside the tumor, whenever you see these wavy kind of lines, uh, that's actually not bad. When you see these straight lines that point directly into the tumor cells, that's bad. And these are the, er the areas of connective tissue that are helping the tumor grow. If they're going around the tumor, it's not so much, but once they start, not so, not so, um, uh, bad of prognosis, but when they start growing into the tumor, it, uh, and, and what they found is that these, they, they provide these little highways for the tumor cells to grow out of, and it promotes the spreading and the dissemination of the cancer cell. So this tumor stroma is extremely important. Now, if we go back to our connective tissue stiffness for a minute here, resulting from chronic inflammation and fibrosis, we know that both chronic inflammation and fibrosis are are predisposing factors for cancer growth. I mean, and so this is a serious thing. And not only does uh, inflammation and fibrosis help the cancer, as I said, but in return, the cancer secretes molecules that further increase the, t the stiffness of the tissue. So it, it becomes a self sort of feeding uh, sort of cycle where um, the, the, the cancer promotes the stiffness and the stiffness promotes the cancer. So stiffness is not good, all right? So let's go back to our uh, stretching. <laughs> so when we talk about stress, okay, we, a lot of people in this uh, audience are very interested in stress, right? What do we talk about when we talk about stress? We talk about mostly the stress that we experience in our lives. But the word stress also has a, a very specific meaning in biomechanics. Stress, right, when you stress a piece of material, the amount of stress is the force that you exert on the material divided by the cross-sectional of the area of the material. If you apply a very, very small force on a very small amount of, of area, you're going to have a, a, a bigger stress, okay? And um, strain is something we think about uh, is, is uh, we think about strain, like the strain of sort of you know, different, needing to do different kinds of things. But in, in biomechanics, strain means the amount of deformability. How, and here I'm going to use a prop that actually Mr. Kanbar just gave me before the lecture, which is this rubber band. So if you have a rubber band, right, that is really, really stiff, okay, and, and it's hard to deform, okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to put a large amount of force, and therefore large, uh, the uh, rubber band is going to experience a lot of stress, but there's going to be low strain, not a lot of deformation. If, on the other hand, I have a piece of really sort of loose fabric, for example, that is very, very loose, a, a, think of sweater, and you're going to deform it. The, the sweater is going to be very compliant. So the stress is not going to be large, but the strain will be a large because the, the, um, the, 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 the sweater is going to deform. So something that is very um, stiff will have uh, low, uh, high stress and low strain, 
okay? And so everything that we do in our body interacts with the connective tissue. And depending on how stiff it is, it's going to influence the, what we call the stress and strain relationship <coughs> between the, the effects of the mechanical force. So that's important. But another thing that's really important is that we are not rubber bands, right? We are living bodies. And therefore, our tissues respond to the mechanical forces and by having biological reactions that then change the, 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 the tissue itself. So this whole thing is, is this whole relationship of body movements to, and applied forces to stiffness and to the uh, amount of the, the, the moving and the deformation of the body is something that's constantly in evolution. Every time you move, every time you have a massage or an acupuncture treatment, somehow it's tweaking your connective tissue and the connective tissue can change in stiffness as a result of that because it's, that's, that's how connective tissue is. It's plastic. So this is very important to remember. So all of our, our, our treatments are having an, in, uh, an interaction with this. But the million dollar question is, what, how, does these, how do these mechanical forces and tissue deformation interact with this inflammation and fibrosis and cancer? What is the relationship between those things? So we decided to address this uh, in our lab quite some time ago uh, with some animal models. And here I'm going to make sure that people understand that you know, the animal models that I'm going to describe here, first of all, they are very important, we think. They're important in order to be able to study uh, this, this, this very important subject. But they're also very humane. Uh, we don't make the animals suffer in any way uh, other than very, very mild, mild amounts of, of uh, discomfort when we, uh, and I'll, sh I'll show you the two different techniques that we use. One is what we call a uh, micro-injury. So we're literally causing an injury that's literally in the millimeter range, something that you can only see under the microscope. And we, this is the injury that I showed you before. We essentially cut the connections between the connective tissue planes in the back, and then we let it heal, and it causes this scar. And we follow what we call the resolution of the injury. And this is important because uh, we can follow the different types of cells. First, the neutrophils, which are the cells that are the big attackers at the beginning. And then what we call the M1 macrophages, which is the macrophages that kind of take it to the next stage where the resolution starts. And then the M2 macrophages, they're essentially cleaning up the mess. And then so they come, and they clean up the degree, and they help to create a nice, <laughs> new, healthy tissue. Okay, So that's our first model. This is what we call acute self-limited inflammation. Now, we also have another model, which is chronic. Now, that's on purpose. We want a model where this nice resolution doesn't happen. So instead of doing a little injury, we inject a tiny, tiny little amount of this thing called carrageenan. Now, carrageenan, I hate to say, is something that's in the yogurt that you eat, <laughs> or the ice cream, or it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's a lot of food products. It's a, it's, a pro it's, a, it's a molecule, it's not a protein. It's derived from seaweed. And uh, it's something that if you eat it, apparently, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I've stopped eating. I've started reading a lot of yogurt labels, actually, since we started doing this, this research. But when you inject it subcutaneously, it's not, it, it, it actually co causes this tiny, tiny little amount, again, microscopic. You know, you're talking about something a millimeter. But that continues and persists. So this shows you, this is 24 hours. You get acute inflammation here, two weeks, six weeks, even 10 weeks later, you still see some inflammation. So this is a tiny little essentially injury, if you could call it that, that continues and persists. So it kind of mimics chronic inflammation that happens you know, in people when inflammation doesn't go away. You can see here that the first phase of inflammation is pretty much the same. Those polymorphonuclears, these are the neutrophils. The M1 macrophages, instead of kind of going away here, stay. And then the M2 macrophages, the cleaner uppers, they don't never actually take over. You can see here that here there's all that's left here is M2. Here they're trying, but they're not quite succeeding. And so that's why this inflammation, what we call failed resolution, it doesn't succeed. Okay? So the first thing we wanted to know is, okay, if you just create this little, well, let's, well now that we're going to talk about the first model, right, the little injury model, if you stretch the animal every day, does that help this injury heal? So this was a method that we developed here at the lab at the University of Vermont quite some time ago. And this is this little method where we hold the animal very, very gently by the tail. 
the animal then grabs the edge of the table and stretches their body. And this is something they do spontaneously. And they, they kind of hold their front feet forward and their back feet backwards. And look, at they, they stick their back feet out and they stretch. And we, one of my technicians kind of figured this out once. And they said, I think they actually enjoy it because they don't complain. They don't squeak. They don't struggle. They just stretch. And we think they actually feel good doing it uh, because they really don't struggle. And it's funny because they can do it from about five to 10 minutes. And then after that so amount of time, they've had enough. Then they kind of start to wriggle. And then we know it's time. And then we stop. So it's really interesting. So uh, we, we looked. We used a special kind of stain to look at the amount of newly formed collagen. What that means is this is the new collagen that's put down in order to form the scar. And this red indicates that. And you can see here, this is the non-stretched animal. So the non-stretched animal is simply taken out of its cage for the same amount of time and just basically kind of handled but not stretched. The non-stretched animal, you can see there's a lot more of this pro-collagen in the injured compared to the non-injured animal. But look at the stretched animal. It's almost the same. There's no longer a statistically significant difference between the injured and the non-injured. So it has really reduced the amount of scar that took place. So that was interesting. We then thought, well, this is actually something I'm skipping ahead in time. And I apologize. This slide is a little bit washed out, but I'll talk you through it. This is a, we, we, we did this more recently at the Brigham's. Uh, but it fits there nicely because this is a model of fibrosis. So this is now uh, a disease model of fibrosis. And there's a disease called scleroderma. And scleroderma is an autoimmune disease where people develop fibrosis all over their bodies. Their hands become so tight they cannot bend their fingers and their face. And so it, this is a serious illness that people try to figure out, how can we prevent this? And so we wondered, would stretching help? There's an animal model. Of, it's called GVHD, graft versus host disease, which is also when people get bone marrow transplants, they get a, a, an illness very similar to if, they, if the transplant rejects the patient, they can get something that looks just like scleroderma. And so uh, this, uh, this mouse model is, is like this. And so uh, the red and blue are the, um, of this, are the scleroderma animals, and the black and green are the normals. And we measured both the thickness. We used the same ultrasound method. The reason why this is interesting is because we used the same method that we used in our humans to look at the thickness of their connective tissue and also their mobility. You know how this, this uh, gliding back and forth? So we first looked at the thickness. And you can see with the scleroderma animal, the skin becomes much thicker at two weeks. That's when they have a lot of inflammation. And then it kind of goes back. And then it, it kind of atrophies because the metal model kind of wears out. And so, but the stretched animals are in red. You see, they return to normal faster than the blue animals, which are the non-stretched. So these stretched animals got better faster. And they, they got stretched the same way as our previous one, 10 minutes every day. Now here, this bottom graph is the mobility. This is, this is the displacement. When we measure this with our ultrasound machine, the same way we measure it with the humans, is we measure the relative mobility between the muscle and the skin. And we see here, these are the scleroderma non-stretched. The mobility is greatly reduced, the blue. That's bad. And the stretched animals are almost normal. So they, the mobility of the stretched animals is uh, indistinguishable from the non-scleroderma animals. So in this case, it looks like stretched attenuated the pathology. And we think this is really important. It's really suggests that patients with scleroderma should really have very, uh, um, uh, you know, physiotherapy as part of their of their treatment, and right now that's not part of the um, very well um, uh, established standard of care. The other thing we looked at in these same animals is some genes. We looked at many genes that are associated with fibrosis, and uh, and 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 so we we found that in these particular genes, for example, TGF beta. These are all genes that are associated fi with fibrosis. And we wanted to know, that, did stretching improve those? And uh, in most of them, it, it like for example, TGF beta did not stretch. This is a stretch. This is a non-stretched scleroderma. Uh, but it, it, that was the exception. Pretty much all the other ones, stretching improved them. The ones where it improved the most, and these, uh, these uh, were uh, statistically significant, was the uh, something called ADAM8 and CCL2. And these are 
important molecules where you can see the stretched scleroderma are, all, are closer to normal than the non-stretched. And these are very interesting molecules because they have to do, do with uh, interactions between the cell and the extracellular matrix, which is the, the collagen matrix. So we're, we're going to be very interested in looking at that to see uh, whether these can be used as markers that we can follow these animals. So this is a very recent research. We haven't published this yet. So now I'm going to go back in time a little bit, and I'm going to talk about another model of that, that second model of inflammation that I talked about with the yogurt, you know, the carrageenan. And this was, this was research that was done in my lab at UVM by uh, Sarah Corey, who was uh, a postdoctoral fellow here uh, some time ago. And uh, she was interested in applying this stretching method to rats that had the little carrageenan. Uh, in, and so she's the one who did that for the first time. And she was interested to know if these animals had uh, any pain as a result of the inflammation. And so she did very painstakingly testing on their backs with a little poking their backs to see if they had pain sensitivities called von Frey testing. It takes a lot of patience. And she did that really nicely. And she found that these animals um, uh, had increased pain sensitivity. You see, these are the non-stretched animals. And the stretched animals had decreased pain sensitivity. Here, a higher score is, is, is worse. So they got better. She also noticed they were walking a little funny because the carrageenan was kind of causing them to limp just a little bit. And so she measured the stride length, how, how big a step they took. And she saw the stretched animals were taking bigger steps compared with the non-stretched. So it helped them. So the stretching helped these animals in a behavioral uh, way. And she also looked at their tissue macrophages. So these are the inflammatory cells. And they were much reduced in the stretched animals. So it looked like this stretching was having an effect on the inflammation in the tissues. We still were a little cur curious, though, because we, we were wondering, well, this stretching method is kind of, you know, the animal's doing a lot of things besides stretching, right? It's being a little bit stressed because you know it's being restrained. So maybe it's getting like a flood of cortisol, you know, hormones in the system. Maybe that's what's doing it. Maybe it has nothing to do with stretching the tissues themselves. Uh, the muscles are activated. Perhaps it's a muscle thing. Maybe it has nothing to do with connective tissue. So we did an experiment where we compared active stretching, which is what I just showed you, to passive stretching, where we just anesthetize the animal and then we just stretch it, you know, passively. With this by the same amount. And then the control was anesthesia only. So that controlled for all the stress and other things. Right? And then we found that the passive stretch were almost, was almost as good as the active stretch. They were both better than anesthesia only. So we think maybe active stretching is a little bit better, but we think that stretching of the tissues is part, at least, an important component of this. And we measured this with ultrasound again. So, OK, going back to our inflammation resolution mechanism, we know that this inflammation, resolution of inflammation, gets started. The program that starts this resolution starts as soon as the inflammation starts. It's in the first couple of hours, something happens that helps turning the resolution, the inflammation off. So we wanted to know, OK, so far, we'd looked at something that was two weeks down the line, right? Let's look right away. So the first thing we did is we, did, we looked at acute inflammation. So 48 hours after you inject the carrageenan, this is when the neutrophils, these are the initial responders, right? The first, the, 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 they go and they try to respond to the inflammation. Let's see if that gets affected. And it did. So here again, we're looking at the thickness of the inflammatory lesion measured with ultrasound. It was reduced in the stretched animal. The inflammatory lesion cross-sectional area was reduced. The total inflammatory cell counts were reduced. And the total number of neutrophils. We were surprised by that, because we thought that this response was going to be something that occurred like more with the macrophages and the ones that are doing the, the resolution. But no, apparently it involves the neutrophils themselves. And this is, uh, this is the work of Lisbeth uh, Berueta in, in, uh, in my uh, lab at the, at the Brigham. And she, uh, she was the one who um, did this study, and we just got this published. So OK, so what is this resolution mechanism? And we're very fortunate to have uh, at the Brigham um, somebody by the name of Charles Surhan, who is essentially discovered uh, the, uh, some molecules, a very important class of molecules that are derived from omega-3 fatty acids that you eat in your diet. So fish oil, things like that, oily fish, 
And specific kinds of omega-3, EPA and DHA, these are specific kinds of, of, of fatty acids that get transformed into what we call pro-resolving mediators. And these resolving mediators get formed and, and released right at the beginning of inflammation, and they are the ones that promote the resolution. However, somehow, this needs to be in balance with the attack response, right? The chemoattractant, the prostaglandins, all these other things that are trying to make the inflammation happen, right? So you don't want this to completely stop the inflammation, but you want it to be kind of just in the right amount. It's a balancing act. And so if for some reason the pro-inflammatory mediators prevail, if they essentially dominate the situation, you then get failed resolution, chronic inflammation, and fibrosis. So what determines that? So we wanted to measure that. So we looked at these pro-resolving and pro-inflammatory mediators within the inflammatory lesion in the same experiment I showed you before, 48 hours after carrageenan. So this was the, we looked at, the first thing uh, we did is we said, okay, let's, ha let's see what happens if you inject this, this resolvin, that's the, um, the, this resolution molecule. Let's, in let's inject it into the body and see and it mimicked the effect of stretching. So this is stretching without the resolvin, and this is resolvin without stretching. And you can see that the two have a very similar effect. Then we thought, okay, let's look at the tissue and see whether there's resolvin being produced in the inflammatory lesion, and it did. So the inflammatory lesion is making its own resolvin. And we then looked at the inflammatory component, leukotriene B4, which was our marker of inflammation, and that was reduced. And then we, but that was not by itself statistically significant. But when you looked at the ratio between the resolvents and the, remember I said that sort of uh, tug of war between the two, that was greatly enhanced. So here, there is the, the relative amount of resolvin to leukotriene is increased. And we think that that's really what matters. It's the ratio of the two. So we then thought, okay, what is the, where, who's making the resolvents? We don't know yet, right? So we think, we hypothesize that it's the connective tissue that's making the resolvent. So we thought, okay, let's take a piece of connective <coughs> tissue and, and put it in a dish and see if it can make resolvents and see if stretching the piece of connective tissue will make it make more resolvents. So we did that. We took a piece, uh, this again was Lisbeth's work. We took the piece of connective tissue and she designed this absolutely ingenious experiment <coughs> where she put this piece of connective tissue and she made this little well in the center. And then she took neutrophils and she puts them on top of the tissue and then she put at the bottom this chemoattractant, something that calls the neutrophils and makes them move, migrate. And then she compared stretched versus non-stretched tissue. And what she found is that in the stretched tissues, the, my, the neutrophils were staying put. They weren't moving. Whereas in the non-stretched tissue, they were migrating. She was measuring the neutrophils at the bottom, underneath. And so what this sh showed is stretching actually kind of reduced the, the movement of neutrophils through the tissues. And then she looked at how much resolve in this tissue had made, and it had been increased by the stretching. So it looks like this mechanism of resolution can be mimicked outside of the animal. So it's not some sort of systemic effect. Now, I talked about cancer. Well, because we know that inflammation is so important in cancer, of course, it's important to think about, and people have been very actively thinking about, well, what about this inflammation resolution mechanism? Does that have anything to do with cancer? And uh, so there's a group uh, in uh, Japan that did an experiment where they looked at a tumor, uh, the growth of a tumor here, and then they injected this uh, uh, analog. It's a lipoxin analog. So the, this is a, uh, another pro-resolving mediator of the same family as the resolvents. And they injected that into the animal, and you can see how it reduced the growth of the tumor. So we wondered, OK, well, what happens would stretching reduce the growth of cancer, of tumors? And uh, this was done at the University of Vermont. We had, there was a model, this was a lab next door to us, that had a model of where they injected a tiny little tumor in the back of the animals at the exact same location where we put our carrageenan. So we couldn't resist. We had to try this. And we injected, the, instead of injecting the carrageenan into the animal in the subcutaneous right here, we injected the tumor cells. And then we looked and we waited a month and then the, we stretched versus non-stretched the animals and we compared the size of the tumors. So if you look here, you can see that on average, the stretched mice had the smaller tumors. But then there were these 
a couple of animals here, four of them here with the red. And this is because these mesotheliomas were very aggressive tumors. These were not actually supposed to be subcutaneous. This is a tumor of the lining of the lung. They have a tendency to spread. And in those four animals, the, the tumor had broken beyond the subcutaneous tissue and spread to the peritoneal cavity. And we found four of them in our stretch group and only one in the no stretch. So that got us a little bit worried. And we wondered, is it, is it that the, this, this actually, this difference in the metastases in the red was not statistically significant. It could have been just chance. You know, if you could flip a coin five times, you could get four heads and one tail. But, and we had a lot of animals in here. We had about 60 animals, 66 animals. But we, if you subtract those, it were the, the, the animals where the tumor only stayed in the subcutaneous space, there was a highly significant effect of stretching. But because we were worried about this, we did not publish these results. We wanted to wait and check it in a different model where you did not have a problem with metastasis. So we're just doing this now. And this is, I'm just showing you this, uh, just a sneak preview because I'm very excited about this. This is, a, this is a mammary tumor model in mice. And you can see we only have done a very few numbers, but you can see, and there's some variability, but we're starting to see the same thing. The stretched animal tumor weight. The tumor cell count looks like it's reduced. We're going to have to really do more animals here to see if this is real. But what got us really excited is we looked at the resolve and concentration in those tumors, and they were really higher. So that, to us, is a really hint that maybe we're looking at something that's actually happening. So this is all to tell you that you know integrative medicine, in my opinion, is a lot about making new connections between things. And like I was talking at the beginning, you know, making connections between the musculoskeletal system and the immune system is very important. We want to understand the role of connective tissue in many, many different ways. And I think we just have begun scratching the surface. But also understanding the relationship between movement and health, we think is also extremely important. And uh, hopefully there's going to be a lot more to come. So I, felt I want to really, first of all, acknowledge uh, all the people who have done this work, both at the University of Vermont, this was the work, the older work that I talked about, and the more recent work uh, with Lisbeth that I mentioned, uh, our technicians, Sarah Igla, and our collaborators, uh, including Dr. Sirhan at the Brigham. And of course, funding from the Osher Foundation that we are so grateful for, and funding from the uh, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> so we, we're very, very interested in fibroblast responses to mechanical touch. We've, we've for a long time, been interested in, in cytoskeletal remodeling in response to stretching and uh, uh, cytoskeletal-related signaling inside and outside and ATP signaling related to that. So yeah, we're, we're really, really interested in that. We think there might actually be a cytoskeletal mechanism that may be coupled we're not sure yet, perhaps with the, with the um, uh, sort of um, metab metabolic pathway where the resolvents are produced, but we don't know yet. So, Great question. Well, that's kind of, yeah, it's a great question. Could you stretch another part of your body? Say you have an injury here. Could I stretch somewhere else, right? That's what you're asking? Basically, our being Systemically, yeah. yeah. So we don't know, but we, that's why we did that first experiment where we took the tissue out of the animal so that there's no doubt about it. There were no muscles there, no brain, no, no nothing else, no vascular system. And we still saw some, some form of, we can't really call it anti-inflammatory effect because you, know, you can't have inflammation without blood vessels. But there was certainly a, a suggestion that the immune system, I, you know, in this case the neutrophils, were behaving differently in this case. And, and so, uh, there might still be some systemic effects that we are going to need to look into uh, because certainly the resolvent does get into the blood. Uh, but it's, it's not really clear right now where, how much of an endocrine effect this is happening. But we're, yeah, for sure, it's possible. Yeah. No, we're not. Yeah, it's a good question. We are not set up in the lab to look at that. We don't, but um, certainly oxygenation, uh, and, and sort of, you know, reactive oxygen, you know, species and, and acid base, all those kinds of things, very, very important. But that's not uh, an area that, that, that we look at. But it, it very well could be related. It's a really good, good question. So I can't say anything about that, unfortunately. <laughs>
We spend a lot of time thinking about that. As a matter of fact, we've just, uh, the dose is super important, right? What's the right dose? How much, how often, how, how hard should you stretch? Um, and and uh, how, uh, so, of course, these, uh, to determine the dose of something, you need uh, huge numbers of animals. Very difficult, right? You have to, to determine every single parameter, first individually, then in combination, factorial designs up the wazoo. I mean, you know, crazy. So we've decided that the first thing we're going to try to understand is how long do you need to stretch? Because if you notice, 10 minutes are animals. I mean, you wouldn't, most people wouldn't want to stretch for that long. And so the first thing we're going to try to do is stretch less time and see if it still works, like, like with 10 seconds enough, you know? We did a little bit of time in ter uh, work in terms of how often, so we tried doing it every other day. It didn't seem to work quite as much. The animals get the weekend off, uh, and the technicians too, <laughs> so they don't get stretched Saturday and Sunday, but five days a week seems to be better than every other day, so that we know. Uh, and then in terms of how quickly after the injury, very important, we start right away. We think that that's why this 48-hour experiment to me is key. It's see, they only get stretched three times. And it, look at the effect we got. So it seems to be it's right away. And I think a lot of like orthopedic surgery, physical therapy, they're moving in that direction. Used to be the yardstick, they put you in a cast. You know, you wouldn't be able to move, let alone stretch. Now they take you out of the cast and they start <laughs> moving. I think people start understanding that already, you know, in terms of practice, but we don't know the mechanisms, of course. So you know, now we, I think we're getting closer to understanding, of the, you know, getting closer anyway to a mechanism. Oh yeah, they stretch for sure, but it's not as sustained. I mean, they still have, they still stretch. Uh, well, that's an issue also because sometimes, um, you know, certainly the, the, the no stretch animal is not like it's immobilized. So it still gets a certain amount of stretch, but it looks still like we're seeing differences between our groups. So even with a sort of, yeah, and also for the everyday life of the animal. These animals are not, you know, in a, immobile, you know. So, yeah, we actually have another model where we prevent the animals from stretching. Uh, that's a whole other story. Um, we do, yeah, but uh, then we want to know what happens when you can't stretch, you know, but, yeah. So I think we're going to uh, hold the rest of the questions for now, and we'll have a couple more minutes for you. Uh, thank you again so much, Dr. Langevin, for thank launching you. our series. Thank you, Mr. Canbar, Mr. Osher, Dr. Bitterman, our other guests from the Osher Center Leadership Board and Advisory Boards. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us.